The next item of business is a statement by Paul Wheelhouse on unconventional oil and gas. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement and therefore no interventions or interruptions. I call on Paul Wheelhouse. Ten minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I would like to take this opportunity to update Parliament on the progress of our research into unconventional oil and gas in Scotland. The Scottish Government has adopted a clear and consistent approach to emerging technologies that could develop Scotland's onshore hydrocarbon resources. Our approach to unconventional oil and gas is one of caution while we gather and consider evidence in those new technologies that have been proposed by industry. That process has already resulted in a decision last month not to proceed with underground coal gasification in Scotland. Against the backdrop of our cautious, evidenced approach, there are some, such as the UK Government, who wish to pursue a gung-ho approach to support the industry, uh, or others who seek an immediate ban, who do not want to wait for research and evidence, and who have put forward their views without concern for differing interests and views of those who would be affected across Scotland. I have no doubt both are sincere in their views and beliefs, but it is the job of government to base our decisions on evidence, taking proper account of public opinions and to seek a collective way forward, and we are deeply sceptical of the approach of the UK government. There is much heat on this issue. It is our intention to go through a process that sheds light on these issues. In doing so, we must also remember that shale resources in Scotland are located across the central belt in the uh, Midland Valley, one of the most densely populated areas of Scotland. Those communities would be directly affected by any unconventional oil and gas development and must be given genuine opportunities to explore and discuss the evidence and issues in depth and at length. Uh, Presiding officer, our precautionary consultative approach is the right approach and it is one that has been widely supported by communities, industries and other uh, interested parties. To allow us to gather a comprehensive body of evidence and prepare for an inclusive debate and consultation, we put in place a moratorium on unconventional oil and gas in January of 2015. This means that no such projects can take place. For the avoidance of any doubt, the moratorium covers hydraulic fracturing, also known as fracking, and coal bed methane technologies. Presiding officer, today we have reached a major milestone in this process, and I can confirm that the research reports have now been published in full. The research was carried out by leading independent experts in their respective fields, and the findings will deepen our understanding of the issues. At this stage, the Scottish Government is not making any judgments on the findings. As we set out when we established the moratorium, the publication of the research will now be followed by a period where we and the public can scrutinise, question, challenge and discuss the findings before we begin a public uh, consultation. We have provided the Chamber with hard copies of executive summaries of the research and I encourage you all to read the reports at your leisure. I would now like to draw attention to some of the main aspects of the research I believe demonstrate the value and significance of the work that we have published today. Uh, central to this work is the economic impact uh, research carried out by KPMG, which has identified a number of potential industry development profiles in Scotland which have informed the other studies. These scenarios are based on estimates of potential oil and gas resources that have been informed by discussions with stakeholders, including those representing industry and environmental interests. The study has quantified the associated economic impacts of any prospective activity to the Scottish economy using a range of measures including uh, expenditure, gross value added, tax revenues and employment. A number of projections for economic benefit and employment have been put forward previously, and this report uh, presents an impartial assessment of the potential impact that an industry in Scotland could have. KPMG conclude that under their central scenario, 20 well pads of 15 wells each could lead to cumulative direct expenditure of £2.2 billion in Scotland over the period through to 2062, which would create a supply chain impacts and other induced economic impacts amounting to an additional £1.2 billion over the period and be responsible for supporting up to 1,400 direct, indirect and induced jobs in Scotland at its peak. To put these economic impacts into context, the report states that on an annual basis this represents, and I quote here, on average 0.1% of Scottish GDP in our central scenario. The report also discusses a number of other potential economic considerations, including the use of gas as a feedstock in the petrochemical industry, the impact on local house prices, road use, uh, agriculture, visual amenity, environmental costs and health costs. Given our commitments to carbon reduction and climate change, these impacts must be considered alongside any economic impact. The Committee on Climate Change were asked to examine the impacts on territorial carbon emissions of unconventional oil and gas activities in Scotland and to consider how the impacts uh, might vary over time. The study sets out three tests which would need to be met for the development of unconventional oil and gas to be compatible with Scottish climate change targets. These tests are emissions are limited through tight regulation, uh, Scottish unconventional oil and gas production displaces imports rather than increasing domestic consumption, 
and emissions from production of unconventional oil and gas are offset through reductions in emissions elsewhere in the Scottish economy. The study also provides a quantitative analysis of potential emissions under a number of regulatory and production scenarios. The committee estimate that under a high production scenario, CO2 equivalent emissions in 2035 could be between 1.1 megatons per year and 2.6 megatons per year, depending on the strength of regulation. Under the central production scenario, emissions are estimated to be 0.6 megatons per year in 2035 if the minimum necessary regulation were adopted. The overall conclusion of the health impact assessment conducted by Health Protection Scotland is that, and again I quote, the evidence considered uh, was inadequate as a basis to determine whether development of shale oil and gas or coal bed methane would pose a risk to public health if permitted in Scotland, unquote. If an industry were to proceed, the report discusses a precautionary approach that would be proportionate to the scale of the hazards and to the potential health impacts. Health Protection Scotland note that this could be, and I quote, could be based on a range of mitigation measures involving operational best practice, regulatory frameworks and community engagement. The study examining transport impacts uh, carried out by Ricardo estimates that an individual well pad could require traffic movements to be sustained at around 190 uh, per week for a period of approximately two years during the development phase. Ricardo note that the main factor affecting traffic flows is the requirement for transportation of water. If that can be avoided, for example, by use of pipelines or reusing wastewater, Ricardo concluded that the impact can be significantly reduced. Ricardo also observed that any increase in vehicle movements could result in an increase in noise, vehicle emissions, road damage or traffic accident risks. Uh, Ricardo notes that, and I quote, providing the, uh, the, provided the planning and EIA or environmental impact assessment system is properly implemented, any significant impacts would be avoided through the use of appropriate mitigation measures, unquote. However, the report also states, and I quote again, local communities would nevertheless experience an increase in traffic numbers, potentially for an extended period of a number of years, unquote. The decommissioning study carried out by ACOM and seismicity study carried out by British Geological Survey have each reviewed international literature and practice to draw conclusions on potential hazards and what, if any, steps could be taken to mitigate those hazards, including regulatory actions. ACOM concludes, and I quote, there is a low risk of post-decommissioning well failure, unquote. ACOM also note that there is potential for improvement in existing regulatory provisions. The study undertaken by British Geological Survey concludes that hydraulic fracturing is generally accompanied by micro-seismicity, and I quote, uh, the probability of felt earthquakes caused by hydraulic fracturing for recovery of hydrocarbons is very small, unquote. The study also observes that improved understanding of the hazard from induced seismicity and the successful implementation of regulatory measures to mitigate the risk of induced seismicity are likely to require additional data from a number of sources, uh, including improved monitoring capabilities. As we committed to uh, doing as part of the moratorium, the Scottish Government has hosted a workshop with regulators. A record of that meeting is now available to view on the Scottish Government website. And finally, to ensure that the full range of environmental issues are given due consideration, a full strategic environmental assessment will also be prepared and considered before a final decision is taken. Presiding Officer, I am confident the reports we have published today deepen our knowledge of the evidence and shed light on the issues and choices that this industry presents. As I hope the Chamber can tell from the summary of the research, no one study can give a conclusive view on this industry and whether or not it has a place in Scotland's energy mix. Some will say that this research shows the economic impact is low and the risks too great. Others that the risk can be managed and the potential economic gain cannot be ignored. The reports rightly do not make recommendations on whether UOG should be permitted or not. The science and evidence informs the debate and it is now time for that debate to take place. I'm able to confirm today that our consultation on unconventional oil and gas will launch on schedule early in the new year. In view of the importance of discussing unconventional oil and gas in the context of wider, both wider energy use and climate change matters, I can also confirm that the launch of the consultation will be coordinated with the publication of our climate change plan and the consultation on Scotland's draft energy strategy. The consultation, which will cover hydraulic fracturing and coal bed methane, will not simply be an opinion poll. I do not believe that would do justice to the broad and complex range of issues that people care about and that need to be debated. The consultation will continue the process of presenting evidence, encouraging discourse and will allow the public and stakeholders to set out their views. Presiding officer, our consultation will give everyone who has an interest in this issue an opportunity to express their view. This is what the public and stakeholders expect and this is what we are delivering. Our, once the consultation closes and the results have been independently analysed and published, we will make our recommendation on the future of unconventional oil and gas and allow Parliament to vote on it. 
after which the Scottish Government will come to a considered judgment on the future of unconventional oil and gas in Scotland. I know that everyone in this chamber recognises the different opinions that exist on the development or otherwise of unconventional oil and gas. This Government has maintained a consistently sceptical and precautionary approach throughout. In reaching a final decision as a Government and as a Parliament, it is imperative that every step we take a careful, considered and evidence-based approach and that we do so alongside an informed public debate. Given the significance of the issue, that is right and proper way to proceed. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I can only allow around 20 minutes for that, and we are really tight, so if you could please have fairly short questions and answers, please, Minister. And could I ask those who wish to ask questions to press their speak buttons? I call on Alexander Burnett, to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Minister for advance sight of his statement. Uh, as an Aberdeenshire MSP, can I firstly congratulate Colin Clark and Ian Taylor on winning their respective council by-elections in Inverurie and Banff last Thursday. And no wonder, and no wonder, we've after the raiding of our fossil fuel industry in the North East to fund an economy missing out on fracking. Dr Stuart Patton recently said there are a number of contradictions in the Scottish Government's energy policy. And nowhere was that contradiction more evident than in this morning's Scottish Energy News, where we see the Cabinet Secretary posing with his minister with a company that has just been awarded a quarter of a million pounds to improve the technology for onshore fracking. It is simply breathtaking, just hours after this publication, the minister can come to the chamber and talk about a clear and consistent approach and yet still give no timescale for a decision on fracking. Scotland industry and consumers need direction. So why has the minister once again failed to deliver and when will we get a decision? Uh, before you get up, Minister, can I say to use question time so I think to be an appropriate uh, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, on the issue of the timing, I, I'm not sure if the member was not listening or reading my statement uh, indeed um, beforehand, but I did set out that in the new year we're going to launch the consultation, public consultation. This is an extremely important issue for Scotland to debate and get right as a policy area. Unlike the UK Government, we are not taking a gung-ho approach supporting an industry when there are significant concerns among the public and stakeholders as to the success or otherwise of this industry. We feel it is vital, particularly given the concentration of population in the Midland Valley, the main area where this activity may be likely to take place if it were to go ahead, that we listen to the views of communities and indeed wider stakeholders and to take soundings on the strength of the evidence we have presented today. We're not taking it for granted that the research will not be challenged by stakeholders in the industry and we think it's important to listen, something that perhaps the Conservative Party would do well to do uh, to wider issues, not just on energy policy. And in regards to the support for the oil and gas industry, I would just indicate to uh, Mr Burnett, I hope he studies closely the economic impact study by KPMG. I know the Conservative Party have made great claim about uh, shale gas and other technologies providing an alternative uh, route uh, to safety for the oil and gas industry. Uh, I would leave it to Mr Burnett to judge whether those figures that are presented in the KPMG study match up to his expectations. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Can I thank the Minister for prior sight of the statement and the range of reports. It is disappointing that the Scottish Government has not today gone for a public consultation on an outright ban on onshore fracking, especially as the Minister stated on the 6th of October that underground coal gasification would not be part of Scotland's energy mix. As COP22 opens in Marrakesh, does the Minister agree with me that the climate change science is irrefutable and indeed was before the reports were even commissioned, and that our communities and for our children and grandchildren and for jobs in clean energy now and in the future, we should not lock into another fossil fuel? If he does, why does he not announce a public consultation on an outright ban on fracking like I have done in my ban fracking in Scotland bill? Paul Wheelhouse. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, a uh, number of issues there. Certainly on underground coal gasification, on reviewing the evidence, it was very clear that there were very significant health and safety issues uh, in present in that industry. What we have to take account, if we're taking an evidence-based approach to look at the work we have published in advance in our manifesto student platform, where we'd have a consultation following publication of evidence, and we are maintaining our commitment to do exactly that. 
It's for uh, others, including Claudia Beamish, who I'm sure will be active in participating in the Scottish Government's consultation when it happens in the new year, uh, to submit their views on that research. There may be aspects of it which are supported. There may be aspects of it which are challenged. We think it's right to put the research we've commissioned out there, invite the public to engage in a debate, and to give ultimately a Parliament a vote on the recommended approach we, we put to Parliament. So we're trying to be inclusive, including all parties in this chamber, to have the opportunity to give their verdict on uh, our recommendation based on the evidence in the consultation, and then we'll take it from there. But I give the member an assurance, certainly on, on Marrakesh, the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, Rosanna Cunningham, uh, intends to attend the Marrakesh uh, COP and to give Scottish perspective on that. And we take extremely seriously the impact of our actions as a country on global climate emissions. And indeed, the Climate Change Committee's work informs us of what their estimate is as to the climate change impact of this industry. And again, without pressing judgment on those figures, I would invite others to give their comment on the research we published on climate change impact today. John McAlpine to be followed by Myrtle Fraser. Officer, is the Minister aware of the recent Stirling University report by Professor Andrew Waterson and William Dinan on the public health implications of fracking, which noted that the evidence base for robust regulation and good industry practice is currently absent and it found multiple serious challenges surrounding location, scale, monitoring and data deficits facing regulators overseeing onshore UGE and fracking in the UK? Paul Wheelhouse. We're well, certainly aware, uh, Presiding Officer, of the research that Joan McAlpine refers to, and uh, while Health Protection Scotland have looked on our behalf at significantly uh, at the um, health uh, impact uh, information and published their report today, that is a review of the primary research that's been undertaken by Health Protection Scotland. And I'm aware that the, the study that's referred to at the University of Stirling has also done a literature review looking at secondary and primary data sources. I would just certainly encourage all those who have a view, whether it's uh, to challenge the information that's been presented by Health Protection Scotland or indeed to supplement it in the case of the work that Joan McAlpine refers to, to submit that research when the consultation uh, is taken forward in, in January. There's an opportunity for all stakeholders, regardless of their view, to feed in and make sure we have access to the fullest range of, of views and information on the subject. Martin Fraser to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Uh, thank you. The Minister didn't answer my colleague Alexander Burnett's questions. Let me try again. We know the consultation has been published early in the new year. When will the consultation close and when will the Scottish Government reach a decision? Paul Wheelhouse. Well, I, I think it did try and answer Alastair Burn Alexander Burnett's question in saying that we had set out in the statement this, the resumption of the, the consultation. We're looking to do that in the, uh, over a sort of a four-month period initially to take the, the findings and uh, produce, uh, obviously, feedback to tie in with, as I said, with the climate change plan and also the energy strategy which is being developed in the course of next year. So we're looking to complete both those documents in the second half of, of, the, of the year, 2017, and take on board our view as we form it on uh, the development or otherwise of onshore oil and gas. Jackie Bailey, followed by Mark Ruskell. The Minister will be aware that many people point to the economic benefits of fracking as a justification for doing it. So can I therefore ask the Minister about the assessment of economic impact and draw his attention to Table 1.2 in the paper. The table measures impact over 40 years and notes that spending in Scotland in the central scenario will amount to £55 million per annum. In the low scenario, £12.5 million per annum. Per annum. Does the Minister therefore believe that these relatively low figures justify a risk to our environment and public health? Paul Wheelhouse. As I said in my statement, uh, Presiding Officer, I'm trying to avoid giving a government view on the figures, but I do note uh, for the record the, the figures that uh, Jackie Bailey raises, and I merely put it to, to stakeholders, including those colleagues across the chamber, to look at the balance in terms of the different factors we've outlined today, the economic impact, the climate change impact, the health impact, the decommissioning impact, transport impact, to ensure that we take a rounded view on the impact across all these issues. That's what government has to do. Uh, if we focused on one or other, that would be uh, perhaps a false position. We need to let the people tell us which they think is more important and, and feed into our consultation uh, in, the, in the, uh, the course of the winter. And so I, I do recognise the figures are, are ones which are in the report, but I'm not going to pass judgment on them today, if, if, uh, with apologies to Jackie Bailey. Mark Ruskell, followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And, uh, Minister, the, this Parliament has got a legislative duty to scrutinise the climate action plan that your own government is currently producing. That's been delayed. It will now be out in January, as you've indicated, alongside the energy strategy. But what's going to appear 
under the headline fracking in both of these documents? Will there just be a giant question mark? What are, what are people meant to think of that? Minister, will you at least uh, release the strategic environmental assessment ahead of the public consultation into unconventional gas in January? Will you also commit to including full liability on clean-up costs in any decision-making that you come to? Paul Wheelhouse. Well, I certainly recognise the importance of the issue from the point of view of its uh, linkage to our climate change plan, which Rosanna Cunningham is leading for the government, and the <coughs> energy strategy, which I'll be taking forward on behalf of the government, which are going to be um, published in January as well. People can look at all these documents in the round, so they can look at the consultation on uh, unconventional oil and gas, they can look at the energy strategy, they can look at the climate change plan. And of course, we will uh, be able to do so in terms of the, as I've outlined to Myrtle Fraser, in the course of the year, take on board these points in terms of the finalised documents. And I'm sure there will be a very healthy debate around the role of unconventional oil and gas uh, around the consultation itself. I will com commit to the member, we are looking to try and take on board the findings of that consultation and take that on board in the finalised uh, energy strategy. And I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary for, uh, for Environment, cl uh, Climate Change and Land Reform will also be taking heed of the consultation too. Willie Rennie, followed by Angus Macdonald. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I also thank the Minister for an advanced copy of his statement and the voluminous uh, reports that he has supplied today. I have to admit, I have not read them all yet. Um, but it's pretty clear that the government is on a long journey to saying no to fracking. And it's good news that today it has not given the go-ahead to fracking. But following on from what Murdo Fraser asked, can he just clarify Will it be the end of 2017 when we get a final conclusion and decision by this government on this issue? Paul Wheelhouse. I, it is my intent, as, as the Minister responsible for the energy strategy, to make sure, if it is at all possible, and I, I intend this to be the case, that we take on board our view of what uh, we propose to do in relation to unconventional oil and gas in our finalised energy strategy next year. Uh, they're being published, that's being, the draft is being published in parallel with the climate change plan. Clearly, the debate we're going to have around unconventional oil and gas will have an impact, I'm sure, on our consideration of both uh, key documents. But what I cannot uh, predict is how Parliament will vote. As I say, we're going to put a recommendation to Parliament, and I don't want to prejudge the view of Parliament, clearly, for protocol reasons. But I would uh, anticipate that we'll have a lively debate in Parliament, and we will then have a vote on the position, and Government will reflect on the vote of Parliament at that time. And I, in order to answer the uh, sedentary question that uh, Mr Rennie has asked, I will intend to do that by the end of 2017. Angus MacDonald, followed by Maurice Golden. Thank you, President Officer. Given the significant local interest, I'm sure the vast majority of my constituents in Falkirk East will welcome the publication of the research reports and the Minister's confirmation that the full public consultation is to go ahead at the turn of the year. Can I ask the Minister what weighting will the Scottish Government give to the findings of the Public Health Impact Study when it has reviewed the submissions from the consultation prior to making its final decision. Paul Wheelhouse. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, clearly, um, health impact is, a, is an area which there will be a lot of public interest in. And alongside the other issues I've flagged up, and indeed response to Jackie Bailey, would make the same, same similar point uh, to Angus MacDonald, who I know has got a very strong interest in this issue from a constituency perspective that we need to try, uh, try and uh, put the information out there, invite communities across Scotland to give us their view on what they feel are the most important factors that we are presenting to them. Clearly, there's issues about health impact, e economic impact, uh, decommissioning impact, and so forth. All the different studies are important on the right. We're not intending to assign a particular value to them, but instead invite the communities of Scotland and wider stakeholders to tell us what they think are the most important things we should take into account when forming our recommendation to Parliament. And I will certainly listen very carefully to views from uh, Falkirk as well. Maurice Golden, followed by John Mason. Uh, I thank the Minister for the advanced copy of the statement. But does he agree, given that climate change has no borders, Scotland could decrease global carbon emissions by reducing the requirement to import foreign fossil fuels by embracing this technology? Paul Wheelhouse. Well, I would certainly, um, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I would invite uh, Morris Golden or anyone else who, who shares his view to, to submit to the consultation if they believe that is an important factor. We're not prejudging 
uh, the importance of any one factor, including climate change, but they're clearly all important studies which hopefully inform the debate, shed more light on the subject and enable us all to take a, a, a hopefully a, a less heated but more uh, enlightened view of uh, the debate and make sure we come to a considered view across Scottish society. Clearly there, there are issues and, and KPMG highlight them that the potentially um, the uh, substances which can be extracted through, through fracking or coal bed methane could be used as feedstock for Grangemouth and other petrochemical plants. Uh, but then you have to think, factor into that scenarios where potentially there's an increase in consumption and whether that uh, then requires um, additional overall emissions or, or, or not. So it's something I would leave to uh, you to uh, members across the chamber, apologies, presiding officer, to, to review the evidence and give your view as to what you think uh, is the important message to take from that. John Mason, followed by Richard Leonard. Uh, thank the Minister for his statement. Uh, I mean, following on from the last question, I mean, would you agree with me that we are very concerned about our climate uh, change targets and that by allowing fracking here, that would uh, in all probability increase uh, the, or uh, make it more difficult for the Scottish Government to achieve its greenhouse gas emission targets? Paul Wheelhouse. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, the, the study that, that has been produced by the Committee on Climate Change, as I alluded to in my statement, gives some estimates as to the potential scenarios, depending on the degree of regulation and the degree of extraction that is undertaken as to the climate change impact that could be, could be uh, felt across Scotland. Um, clearly, in the way that Scotland's uh, legislative targets for climate change have been established without sectoral targets, if there's an increase in emissions in one, in one part of the economy, that then has to be borne across the rest of the economy. And so we're not prejudging how that would be dealt with. Uh, if that was to happen through the economy to meet our existing climate change targets and indeed to increase our ambition in climate change in due course, we'd have to find some form of mitigating those emissions, providing officer, and clearly that's something that the government would have to take into account at the time we make a recommendation to Parliament. Richard Leonard, followed by Evan McKee. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, can I recap then that once the consultation closes, the results will be independently analysed by whom we know not. The government will make a recommendation on fracking and, I quote, allow Parliament to vote on it, which once again the government may or may not pay any attention to whatsoever. Can the Minister tell us why we should believe his government will accept Parliament's verdict next time when it didn't accept it last time? And will he confirm that none of this will be concluded in time for the people going to the polls in next May's local elections? Paul Wheelhouse. Okay, presiding officer, without seeking to find division with the Labour Party on, on this issue, I think that last point just shows the, the motivation of the member. Oh, is more interested exactly. in local government elections exactly. than getting the decision exactly. right. Uh, we want to get... I would invite Mr Leonard to, to listen here. We want to get the decision right for the people of Scotland and in the public interest. And we will be listening to Mr Leonard and others who submit to the consultation. The reason why you can be confident uh, as a member of this chamber that we will do exactly what we have said and bring the, the issue to the Parliament to vote on and then reflect on is because we have kept promise in every step of the way on this process so far. We gave a commitment that we would have uh, research commissions in, in light of the gaps identified in the expert scientific panel's study. We have given a commitment to undertake a consultation with the public, which we are uh, publishing details of today and will do. And I give a commitment to the member and to the chamber that we will bring the issue back to the Parliament for a vote and we will listening to the view of Parliament at that time. Yeah. Ivan McKee. Now, would the Minister agree that the negative impacts of fracking affect all parts of Scotland, not just those areas where shale reserves are located? Paul Wheelhouse. <laughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, indeed, uh, as a number of members have indicated, there are issues, whether it's climate change or, or wider impact on the Scottish economy, that, uh, whether positive or negative, that clearly have an impact not just on the, the Midland Valley straddling the central belt of Scotland, but also on the wider uh, communities of Scotland, because uh, it is an important issue, whether it's from the point of view of our contribution to our energy mix or to our economic development, but also to climate change impact. And as I've said in response to uh, questions from Mr Mason, that it would have to be borne if there was additional emissions, would have to be borne by the whole economy, which of course is distributed across the whole of the country. Well, I have to say, here we are under 20 minutes and we're finished. I'm quite stunned. <laughs> uh, no, I, th I think it was excellent. Um, the, everybody, the brevity was amazing. Uh, I shall give a few moments to, for people to change seats and then we'll move on to the next item of business.